Uh, I was chief of the immigrant visa control at the U.S. Department of State for a little over 23 years. Uh, I was responsible for determining the final action dates listed in the visa bulletin. Those decisions resulted in over 9 million immigrant visas and green cards being issued. And I also testified before Congress on two occasions regarding immigration reform efforts. So I'll jump in next. Um, and I'd like to just add in regard to uh, anybody seeking to immigrate to the United States. Again, my name is Bernie Wolstorff. I'm the managing partner of WR Immigration. We have 10 offices throughout the United States. We've been in business for over 35 years. We have about 200 uh, employees and several partners that specialize in EB-5 and investment immigration. So we have a deep bench with extensive experience. But I want to go back and comment on uh, our lead panelist today, Mr. Charles Oppenheim. If you're interested in immigrating to the United States, you have to understand the visa bulletin. The visa bulletin is the roadmap. The visa bulletin is the single document that will tell you how long it will take for you. Well, it's possibly the only document that's going to tell you how long it's going to take for you to immigrate. And obviously planning this kind of move for you and your family requires some idea of waiting lines, strategy, and quite frankly, Charlie's the only one who truly understands the visa bulletin um, all of you can access the visa bulletin. Just simply put it into your Google or search engine, U.S. Department of State visa bulletin. But you want to watch that because that's a critical document. And over to my um, partner, Joey Barnett. Joey, please uh, introduce yourself. Thanks, Bernie. And thanks, Brennan and Duncan, for having us on. My name is Joey Barnett. I'm a partner at WR Immigration I practice primarily in EB-5. I've been doing it for over a decade. Uh, we help immigrant investors get green cards, do the removal of conditions. Um, we've done it for over 5,000 EB-5 investors, and uh, we are filing these on a weekly basis, and, and we're happy to help. And I'll kind of round out here with the introductions, and Brendan and I are you know, helping lead this. Uh, we oversee our global sales team here at EB-5 United. So again, thank you to all of our panelists who are on today. And it's going to be a very productive webinar. All right. And, you know, as, as Duncan mentioned, we both represent EB-5 United. Uh, I've been working in the EB-5 industry for the past 11 years. Um, spent a, quite a bit of time living over in, in Bombay and in India and, and traveling throughout the world um, in that time. And of course, we filed a lot of petitions with with Wolfsdorf and uh, Bernie and Joey have been great for for us and and uh, our success in the in the EB five industry and you know it, it overall in the in these in the process of EB five the the key to obtaining a green card is, is having good counsel because that is who is going to put together your source of funds in a way that is acceptable to USCIS and is going to get you a green card. I think most of the groups like ourselves and, and our major competitors, we we know how to get projects approved. But when it when it comes down to actually getting a visa, obtaining a visa, the number one person that you need is a solid immigration attorney. So we're, we're happy that Wolfsdorf uh, was able to join us here. And of course, again, for those who missed the introduction in the beginning, we're very happy to have Charles Oppenheim on here, who ran the Visa Bulletin for years with USCIS and can give us some great insight into where we stand at this point after the two years after the RIA has passed. Brennan, so. I, uh, I, I'm known for being a little uh, contrarian. Um, you very kindly mm -hmm. said that the immigration lawyer is a critical part. I'm going to contest that to uh, get this going and tell you that we are an important part of the team in the sense of getting the legal work done. I mean, but I, I love telling everybody who's interested in EB-5 that 85 to 90 percent important is project selection. It is I, I, I cannot overemphasize how important this is to be working not only with a reliable regional center that has years of experience, uh, but also with the regional center that has experience 
in choosing the correct project. Now, this sounds kind of fairly obvious, but there's two basic issues uh, in regard to selecting a project and having success with EB5. Um, number one for many is, of course, getting your green card for you and your family. That's a lengthy process. Although under the new RIA, we're getting remarkably fast turnarounds and benefits. And then, of course, the critical element is a few years down the road, getting your money back. Now, I don't endorse any regional centers or projects because I'm an immigration lawyer. It's not my job to do due diligence. But I will say I've worked with EB5 United for, I think I can say, decades um, which would precede both Duncan and Brennan. Um, and I've always found the principals truly committed to doing a good job and their ability in the financial arena. I'm talking about several of the principals. Um, they've had years of experience in reviewing projects, understanding capital stack, which I think is something each one of you needs to understand by the end of this and have always shown a commitment to their clients being responsive making sure they get the money back life's always got challenges but of the many regional centers we've worked with we found eb5 united to be um amongst the if not the most professional group um in terms of number one selecting good projects which will give you that fundamental uh, benefit of number one, getting your green card relatively quickly. I wish USCIS could be quicker, but they've certainly improved. And then number two, of course, making sure that you get your money back. Um, and that's how I define success. And we as a team of immigration lawyers, Joey, myself, and our team of uh, staff are, are very committed to supporting you in that regard so um back to you brennan uh all right well thank thanks bernie for those words um appreciate that but why don't we go ahead and dive right in and so you can start getting some information out to some of the the investors i'll, I'll pull up the presentation here and let you go ahead and get started on some of the basics of eb5 i think we have a fairly educated uh, crew here who is joining us for this. So I think we'll be able to get a little bit more into some of the details um, after this. But Bernie, why don't you go ahead and, and take it away on, on what the changes made yeah. from they were and how they <laughs> so, the program. So, so what I love saying is um, this is a brand new law. For many of you know, the old law, which is like over 30 years old from 1990, uh, that program actually lapsed. And then President Biden in March 22 signed this new law, the Reform and Integrity Act of 2022. And this is a brand new law with new rules. I really like the program, the new program. It's got a lot of investor protections, provides a lot more um, transparency to investors in terms of disclosing uh, the investment, how it's spent. Unfortunately, of course, we have an increase on the minimum investment from 500 to 800,000. That is, of course, if you are in a rural high unemployment or infrastructure related project. Otherwise, it's actually a million and 50. So, but today um, we're going to talk about the minimum investment. Who wants to invest a million 50? The second point or bullet we have here is the one that I really get most excited about because there's two ways to get a green card. One is consular processing abroad, where you go to a, a consulate, you have an interview or embassy, US embassy or consulate, you get a green card. That process can be quite uh, delayed, but we have something like 360,000 Indian students in the US. We have some 300,000 Chinese students. I mean, it's over half a million. And for a few of them, they are eligible to file for an adjustment of status in the US. And we are getting five year work permits within literally 60 to 90 days of filing. I mean, this is phenomenal. And they don't even need to bother with the student visas. In some instances, we can convert and, and 
Many of the cases we see today are people on H-1B stuck in waiting lines and they just want to get out of these waiting lines. The biggest one that I've been pushing and Joey, my partner, and I are having arguments over, but it's my belief that if you file an adjustment under the current rules and you've got a kid who's about to age out, that there is age out protection under the adjustment framework. So um, still some debate on that one, but if you can lock in a kid's age when before they turn 21, that's a phenomenal option for many people. Bernie, not to interrupt you, but I think about 90 plus percent of the people on this webinar are based in the United States, and this is going to be the main benefit. So I think between that and then I, I think about probably 70% are, are Indian or Chinese. And so, you know, the, those are probably the two main points are the set asides and the adjustment of status. Yeah, which has just been, you know, something we've never been able to do. I mean, in the old days, we had to file the 526, wait a year, two years, get an approval. Now we concurrently file. And what that does is it gives complete, what I'm gonna call visa freedom. It's a new phrase I just made up. Uh, visa freedom in the sense that they're no longer tied to that H-1B employer. I mean, we've recently had like massive layoffs in the tech industry, which just creates panic for people who've been waiting 10 years. And then even if you're on an H-1B, and you get a new job offer, you've got to go through the entire perm process again, prove there's no US workers. If that falls foul, uh, you can find yourself getting kicked out after sort of being established here for, for years and years. And this option. Now, I want to turn to, to you, Mr. Oppenheim. Um, you are the guy who understands the numbers, understands these various categories, now, just to simplify, we have three categories, set aside categories under the Reform Integrity Act. We have the rural category, which gets 20% of the allocation. We get the urban and high employment category, which gets 10%. And we get the infrastructure, which is only 2%, so hardly worth talking about. So, Mr. Oppenheim, with your knowledge of visa allocation, what is your general advice, understanding waiting laws with regard to a Chinese or Indian investor? Should we be advising them to look at rural projects because of the double allocation, the 20% uh, or high unemployment? What's your preference and, and what advice do you have in regard to selecting projects uh, under the uh, new RIA, sir? Uh, I think that the rural projects are the, the rural set aside is the best. Uh, as you mentioned, it will receive twice as many numbers each year, 20% of the numbers versus 10% for high unemployment. Uh, therefore, I believe that the rural will be a much better place for applicants to file under the rural, the reserved categories. Uh, well, if you look, if you look at this chart, you will see that all of the the set aside categories are current at this time and i believe that this will continue to be current throughout the remainder of the fiscal year uh, so again i think it's very very good the rurals set aside would be where i would choose and it's important to mention that if you look at the on this chart if you will see the india first second and third preference categories many of those applicants have a a three to 12 year wait time currently. And such applicants, if they are able to do so, could benefit by filing in a the rural reserve or the cho their choice of a set aside category and potentially have two chances at a visa each month uh, based on this chart. And whichever one comes available first, they would be processed. And based on this chart, it appears that rural or high unemployment would become available faster than the first, second, and third preference categories. So Charlie, you, you were responsible for this chart for, uh, you know, literally decades. Um, and you said between three and 12 years, but three and 12 years is absolute time. Uh, let's translate that into what I call uh, real reality. 
for many Indians, like I was speaking with an Indian gentleman uh, who had an approved second preference with a 2016 priority date. Um, but it's not a three or four year wait, right? I mean, at the end of the day, if uh, you have not filed, uh, I mean, this is uh, showing 13 years or so, 12, 13 years to travel, but it could take decades to move this unless Congress makes change. And it's been 34 years. We still don't have a change. Uh, despite your testimony, uh, Congress knows what's going on. So realistically, Chinese and Indian uh, EB2, EB3 are terribly long waiting lines, right? Correct. And I think that the wait time in the uh, China and India second and third preference is likely to increase because of the limited amount of numbers that will be available to those applicants on an annual basis. In earlier years, they benefited by the fact that there were on the first column where it says all chargeability areas, those second and third preferences were listed as current and therefore there were otherwise unused which could fall across and be used in the second and third preferences primarily by indian applicants that so this, is not going to happen going forward yeah th this is something that you've explained to us uh the so-called ro uh, india has benefited enormously from the row rest of the world leftovers but now that we have no leftovers uh this is shocking because I think you said something like the India allocation would be something like only 3,000, whereas in previous years they were pulling thousands and thousands of ROW visas, but those doors are closed now because EB2 and EB3 are actually backlogged for worldwide. So quite frankly, uh, if you're looking at this chart, the only way forward right now for an Indian national, if they don't marry a US citizen, uh, they're not eligible for the lottery. Uh, the only door that seems to be open is the EB-5 category. And that, Charlie, I wonder if you could tell us, you mentioned you expect it to be open for the rest of the year. We've had over 4,000 petitions filed under this new program already, uh, multiplied by 2.5 approximately. You know, there's been a lot of cases filed. You want to give us any guess on how long the runway is before we can no longer do concurrent filing and, and the waiting line will come. Any speculation on that, sir? Well, on the, as this chart shows, uh, right now, there are plenty of numbers available and the amount of uh, cases which have been approved leading to actual processing is very small. So I think that it will be tw fiscal 2025 before we start seeing any appreciable amounts of numbers used in the uh, reserved categories. I think in for the rural category, I think it for China and India it is likely to remain current through much, if not all of fiscal 2025, which is very good for those who are filing now. And on the HUA high unemployment categories, I think that it is likely that uh, at some point during the uh, second half of fiscal 2025 that a final action date could be imposed for both China and India, again, because of the high amount of petitions. But it, that's why it's a, extremely important for anybody that is considering filing in any of the reserved categories at this time to do so in a very timely manner, because doing so allows you to be is close to the front of any line which will develop in the future. And so that is the key thing. If you're considering it, you need to be acting in a very timely manner uh, so that you can get as close to the front of any line which will develop in fiscal 25, potentially, and indefinitely by fiscal 2026. And again, as you mentioned, you want to be able to, if you're in the U.S., you want to be able to take care or take advantage of the concurrent filing. And you can do so as long as the categories are listed as current 
in the visa bulletin or your priority date is earlier than the date listed in chart A of the visa bulletin. Great advice, but Charlie, I remember in 2014, you were warning us about the China retrogression uh, and some people didn't listen to you. So I hope that the audience are now listening because some of those people didn't get your message and, you know, look at the Chinese unreserved category still stuck in 2015. So you need to be on the front of the line. There is going to be a waiting line. You can be absolutely sure. I think you're a little bit too optimistic if you want my personal view, because, and I wanted to ask you this next question, um, which we've seen and you've seen under this new program. And I guess this is because Grassley, Senator Grassley is the key mover of the RIA. President Biden signed it, but President Grassley from Iowa is the principal author of this new bill. And it seems to me that it is heavily biased towards rural in two regards. Number one, we're getting priority processing on the filings. We've had approvals on some of our 526 petitions within like three to four months including on EB-5 United projects, like remarkably quickly. So they seem to be getting priority processing uh, in terms of USCIS pulling the rural cases out and adjudicating them up front, which is a huge advantage. Um, and, you know, I just can't emphasize how important it is because once your petition's been approved, you've seen this as well, um, but... We, we're starting to get a deluge, I don't know if I should use that word, but literally a flood of uh, approvals on our rural projects, but not that many on our urban projects. I want to shoot that question to you, Joey. Um, Joey, we file both rural and we file urban. I don't know if we filed any infrastructures, but um, we're getting much faster approvals on the rural filings than we do on the urban. Is that correct, sir? Yeah, we are. They, they seem to be pri prioritizing the processing of cases uh, in rural areas. You know, if, if you would have told me two years ago that we got a e EB-5 petition approved in three to four months, I, I would have thought you were, you were taking crazy pills, right? Because it was taking years and years and years. They have separated out adjudication teams at the Immigrant Investor Program office to specifically process cases that were filed post RIA. Um, that is to the detriment of the pre-RIA investors, but you know, so is life, it's not fair. It's, it's um, not and fair, it, right? I mean, they're it, really pulling yeah. these cases out and adjudicating these. So we have lots of happy rural clients, which is, you know, we, we, we don't like to push people one way or the other, but the facts are very clear. We're getting these rural approvals in such a fast period of time um, and clients can then get on to their next step because we've got to file the removal of conditions two years after they get their green card approved. So this really gives them a heads up in the process, right? A leg up is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Can I just make a, a point and it sort of relates to a question that's asked in the Q&A. Sure. Charlie, Charlie you, we see these numbers. We see how many filings have already occurred and this is only through october of 2023 so there's there's been more filings since then when you look at that demand for the visas why are you saying that there will be um it will remain current in the reserve categories for an extended period of time is can you kind of explain that the process by which department of state will understand that there is that real demand sort of the hidden backlog I think that's something that is, well, is Joey. Do you mind if I if I just kind of put this in layman's term real quick as far as just describing Go. this? Yeah. Um, Go right what, ahead. What we're talking about here in this on this chart, you see the fifth unreserved category. That is for any past investor pre RIA or any investor that does not invest in a targeted employment area. So a one point oh five million dollar investor. So if you invested from India or China, if you invested in your, you are Chinese, in pre-RIA or in a non-TEA, you would have had to have a filing before December 15th of 2015 in order to obtain a green card. You may have approval already, you may have had approval of your I-526 petition for years, but you cannot get a green card until the day that you filed on this is current. Now, 
there is 20% of the visas going forward that are allocated to, uh, to, to people that invest in rural projects every year. There's 10% for high unemployment. As Bernie said, it's very rare to find an infrastructure project. And so what that means is if we go to the amount of visas available, we had extra visas over the past two years because consulates were shut down during COVID and they did not issue family-based visas and those trickled down into the employment-based category. So we had extra visas the past couple of years. Also, since the RIA, we this year are just now getting to the point where RIA investors are being issued green cards. So last year, there were no green cards issued. We had the first investor post RIA issued a green card this January. And now we've had about six since then. And so th this year is the first year that you're seeing any of the these visas being, being taken. So in the set aside categories, you can see that, that there are 7,773 visas available this year of which 5,085 are for rural investors and 2,543 are for urban investors. That that will reset this October 1st and, and we'll go into next year, but let's not overcomplicate that. But essentially, if you look at the demand of how many people have filed into rural projects and you multiply that by 2.5, the reason why we do that is because on average, there's two and a half people needing a visa for one investor so a fam your your spouse and you know one child half a child because a lot of times you have just one investor so there's been about a thousand people as of october who had filed of, of this past year who had filed into rural projects and there was a little over two thousand who had gone into high unemployment projects you multiply those each by two and a half you know you're around 2500 visas for rural you're close to 5,000 visas needed for high employment. You go back to the amount of visas available. You have 5,000 visas here for the 2,500 rural visas that you need, the demand. You only have 2,500 visas available for the 5,000 visas that you need for the high unemployment. That is where Joey is talking about this uh, invisible backlog, because right now, if you get approved, and if you have an I-5260 approved in an urban project, you're going to get a green card. It's current for both China and India. However, once more of these petitions are approved, then we're going to have more demand for these visas than there are availability. And that's when a final action date will come in. And that is what Charlie used to do at the Visa Bulletin was set those final action dates. So I'll turn this back over uh, to Charlie okay. as far as with Joey's question you know, what are you seeing as, as far as you mentioned that you would see a probably a final action date at some point next year for both of these categories. But if you're investing now as an investor, how are you uh, uh, looking at the potential backlog that you may see? And, and, and we want to get Charlie's answer, but just point out next year starts in five months, right? This is not next year is not that far away we we almost we're talking fiscal years here so the year ends in september but it does seem strange that people have gone for high unemployment when there's only half as many uh visas set aside but charlie what's your prognosis or well, somebody uh, called you recently nostradamus what's your prediction yeah one thing it is important uh to remember that it is the fi if a final action date is applicable at the time final action can take care on your case so the fact that you were to file a petition now uh when it's current it doesn't necessarily mean that the category will be current and you can be processed immediately you know eight months a year two years from now so it is but this this chart does govern the concurrent filing so that's where you're getting the benefit but as brennan mentioned this year the limit is approximately five thousand for rural projects next year it is likely to be in the 40 to 200 range uh we estimated so the way that this department of state will determine whether they need to apply a final action date is only if 
the amount of numbers, for example, if they're in the month of March determining the April dates, they would look back and see, okay, how many numbers were used October through February? How many numbers that they think will be used during the month of March and subtract that from the 4,200 level. And then they will say, okay, they have plenty of numbers left to process all the applicants that we feel that will be documentarily complete and can either be finalized either as an adjustment of status or overseas consular project processing. If they feel that there's plenty of numbers left, then they will allow the category to remain current. But once they determine that there no, there will not be enough numbers to process all of the eligible applicants through the end of the year, then at that point, they would impose a final action date. Uh, and that once they establish final action dates in these reserved categories, I believe they will stay from that point forward. Uh, so again, it is important to act in a very timely manner now, if you're considering uh, the EB-5, one of the three reserved categories. I think that one of the reasons potentially for the high filings in the high unemployment areas is maybe people thought that that would be the better way to go on the assumption that everybody else was gonna be filing in the rural categories. And so potentially they outsmarted themselves because everybody else had the same idea. Oh, well, I'll go for the one others are not likely to file for. But again, uh, when we're talking about the lower limit next year, I mentioned earlier that I thought that, that the category for rural would remain current through much, if not all of the, the year. Again, we're going to have to see large amounts of uh, cases being finalized, resulting in the use of a visa number overseas or adjustment of status. So I, I, you know, in a worst case scenario, I think that it might be, you know, the some early summer for rural before a date, and possibly as early as uh, March or April in the high unemployment areas. Just shooting a question to you, Joey. Uh, in the past, we've seen USCIS ramp up adjustment approvals and even the consulate ramp up consular processing near the end of the fiscal year, right? So uh, it's entirely possible with all these adjustments filed, we could start seeing literally hundreds of cases get approved in August or September of this year to make sure that the visa numbers for this year's allocation are fully allocated. I'm thinking like September 22, the US consulate in Guangzhou issued like 630 visas in August. And then in September, they jumped to 2,300. So to make sure that all the visa numbers were allocated. And in the past, not every year, they've been quite good at trying to maximize issues. So we could see a gigantic surge of approvals, particularly on AOS cases and, and possibly documentarily qualified cases at the consulate. Is that a possibility in your view, Joey? I am very hopeful and that's what we need to happen um, so that these backlogs don't um, or we can prolong before these backlogs occur because the more visas that are used this year that those are less that need to be counted towards the annual limit next year. Um, and so yeah, that's exactly what we're hoping for. And uh, you know, I, I know Bernie, you're, you and I are working with, with AILA, the American Immigration Lawyer Association, trying to push the government to do a little bit better of uh, maximizing the, the, visa, the visa numbers this fiscal year. Easier yeah, said yeah, than done, but you know we yeah, have to be no, trying. That, that's my flag that I like to carry is make sure that we maximize visa issuance, which was always Charlie's mantra when he was the boss uh, yeah. at the State Department. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I'm a little bit more optimistic in when the dates would be applied, need to be applied next year, is I am hoping, as you say, that large amounts of numbers will be used in the summer months this fiscal year, as Joey mentioned, lessening the amount of people that are in line for next year competing for the for the numbers. And again, that's the best case. And again, I do believe that the State Department and USCIS, with more of these cases probably being processed in the future by USCIS, 
they will attempt to maximize number use because they they know this the importance of this program and they they do not want to be seen as quote wasting numbers when a backlog is likely to develop in the future but as a pushy immigration lawyer i'm gonna say look um i'm hopeful with the government but i'm never confident with them doing their job right and my advice to any potential investor is that if you have this kind of money and you are looking at this program you need to file in the next three or four months to make sure that you're in the front of the line and you don't get caught in a in a waiting line but that's my two pennies worth so maybe back to you brennan and uh okay. we can keep going all right we'll keep it going i have one one other question uh charlie for you um sorry to put you on the spot here right so everyone knows what kind of you and joey were just talking about we you see that the the visas that are not used in the set aside categories they last in the set asides for two years so you see this 4478 visas that were new set asides last year are still in the reserved uh, set aside visas this year. Next year, if those are not used, they will be lost to the unreserved category. So you're talking about you know the 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 numbers that about 2,800 of those are rural, uh, about 1,400 are urban. So the more petitions that we can get approved and visas issued by this September 30th the less that we lose to the unreserved categories. Now, also there on some of these approvals, Charlie, I've been, we've been seeing a, a couple of different identifier numbers that are kind of indicating that for non-Chinese and non-Indians, they may be issuing unreserved visas right now to set to investors in in TEA projects that are not in backlog countries on chart A of the visa bulletin. I, I have always thought that that is the way that the USCIS should do it. it they shouldn't be wasting uh, set aside visas on countries that are not backlogged and don't need those. Uh, I just wanted to see if, if what your opinion is after after seeing this and, and if you think that that's how USCIS is going to issue the visas. I, I, I kind of agree with you. Uh, countries, you know, which do not have a final action date, which is everybody except for China and India in the old uh, categories, the C5, T5, I5, R5, where you see dates. Uh, China and India are the only ones in the unreserved category with dates. So there are applicants who are filing now under the new RIA that are getting the their petition approved where they could process either in a reserved category or the unreserved. And I feel that if they're processed in the unreserved, that is much more beneficial because one, the annual limit is much, much higher. And two, then it lessens the impact of need for number use in the reserved categories. So I, I'm with you, Brennan. I think that that would be the uh, my choice. I would just, if person was approved and could be approved in either way, I would stick the rest of world applicants in the unreserved category to make room for numbers for the Chinese and the Indian applicants in the rural high unemployment and set and infrastructure category. Well, that, bottom line is we have 22,000 visas this year, which is a bumper crop, a double quota. So, you know, this this is something we're probably not going to see again in the future. Is that right, right. Charlie? Yeah, this is uh, will probably this carryover will give us a nice amount of unreserved next year as well. But the the limits are going down. Uh, people have gotten a little bit comfortable with seeing the extremely high annual limits in the employment categories in recent years. As Joey mentioned earlier, this is strictly because of the impact of COVID had on overseas processing, and there were uh, extensive unused numbers in the family categories, and those unused numbers from the previous year got added to the next year's annual limit. That has resulted in this year's annual limit for employment being 161,000. I think then in the future years, the employment limit is going to be down in the one, 40 to 150 range and i would actually plan on seeing employment limits of 145,000 which is going to significantly 
reduce visa availability for everybody across the board. Charlie, thank you for demystifying this because honestly, I, I don't know any of us could figure this out without your insightful analysis. So back to you, Brennan. But uh, sorry, I just want to cut in just one last point. The If you file the adjustment while it's current and you get your EAD and advanced parole, which are generally good for five years, if there is retrogression in the future, that doesn't impact your ability to remain in the United States. It doesn't impact your ability to use your EAD. Because you filed your adjustment when you were in lawful non-immigrant status, you are still not accruing any unlawful presence during that time. You're in a pending adjustment type of status if you use that EAD and are no longer working for your H-1B employer. So, you know, even in the future, if that happens, if you take advantage of the opportunity now, um, you know, you can get your EAD advanced parole by the end of this year for sure. Um, and, and you're going to be set. For yeah, you yeah. and your entire family, by the right. way, you, your family, your kids, and then you can open your own business. You can move employers or not be employed or go to school or not go to school. So it really gives you complete freedom of travel and the right to work. I like calling it the red card because it's just as good as the green card. Uh, it gives you all the freedom you have. So that's a huge benefit that we have now with concurrent filing, but that door too will close. So thanks for yeah. explaining that, Charlie. And, and and Joey, as you mentioned, the, the by getting the... Uh, benefits for five years, people that have already filed or those that are filing in a timely manner in the next several months, that five-year cushion is likely to give them time, even if a final action date were applied, their turn is likely to have come up for either immigrant visa issuance or adjustment of status before the five-year period expires. So again, that is a very good reason for trying to file. If you haven't already and are planning to do so, file as soon as you can for this program. All right. Uh, Joey, do, I'll get into kind of the, the investment side of this, but do you want to go through the process real quick and just, I know this kind of explains what you were just discussing. Uh, sure. Maybe run through, through this chart here. Absolutely. So. When you want to do EB-5, the first thing that you need to do is you need to do due diligence and find a good project. That's the first thing. Um, you also need to work with a U.S. immigration attorney to prepare a legal brief regarding your lawful source of funds. The U.S. government is, is very picky on this. Um, and what we generally do is we document that all before the investment actually occurs so that we know where all the money came from and ensure that the petition can be approved. You make the investment, then you file the initial application. That's the I-526E. Because it is current in the visa bulletin, you and your family members are also able to file an adjustment of status if you're in the United States. And with that adjustment of status, you can file for interim benefits, the advance parole, and the employment authorization document, which can come in as quickly as three to four months. Um, your adjustment of status will remain pending until at least your EB-5 petition has been approved and after that when a visa is available. Um, that's if you're in the United States. When your adjustment of status is approved, you'll be given a conditional green card. It'll say that your adjustment of status was approved on date X and that's when your conditional green card status began and it expires on date X plus two years. And you then use that conditional green card to live, work, travel in and out of the country. If you're outside of the United States, once your I-526E is approved, then your case is transferred from USCIS to the Department of State, and we work to schedule an interview at the U.S. consulate abroad. They do consular processing. They take your passport. They give you an immigrant visa. You have six months to enter the United States with that immigrant visa. And when you enter it, they stamp your passport that's what starts your conditional green card period. And then you'll get that conditional green card that says you're, you're good for two years. Um, at the end of that two year period, there is a 90 day window where you can file to remove the conditions. Um, those conditions are, have the jobs been created and was your funds at risk and sustained for long enough? Um, and the answer to those questions should be yes. And once that is adjudicated um, and that I-829 is approved, you will be given 
a permanent green card. I will say, and this kind of goes back to, to your point, Brennan, um, about like what's the most important thing. When you think about the I-829 approval, it's all about the project that you invest in. Have the jobs been created? That's the key for EB-5. It's all about job creation. You get the job creation and your money is sustained for this specified period, you're gonna get your green card. Um, and so that's why doing your due diligence and working with a regional center that can pick pro pick projects that will actually get that job creation completed, that is the key for success for EB-5. I agree completely. And, and to add to that, using the regional center program makes that a lot more easy because then all you have to do is prove that you spent the money on the project to show the job creation because it's an economic model. When you do a direct investment, first off, it's probably gonna be far more than 800,000 because you can only do it as one single investor now and an $800,000 business is not going to create 10 full-time W-2 employed jobs. But when a direct EB-5 project, you're going to have to sustain those jobs and have full-time permanent employees at the site until you have completed this process and filed your 829 petition. Whereas with the regional center program, all we need to do is show the expenditures on the project and we can include all the induced jobs <clears throat> and the indirect jobs and the jobs from the construction of the project. That's why 99% of EB-5 projects are real estate based. One, because the construction allows for the job creation for everyone to get a green card and two, because the underlying real estate is utilized as collateral for the EB-5 loan. And if you, that way you have something tangible that you can take from the developer if they default on your EB-5 loan. And that takes us kind of right into, um, you know, the project structure and how this works. <clears throat> I think we've gone through um, most of the process here. So maybe Joey, just briefly go through the, the types of sources of funds that investors can utilize. And then I'll get into yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a wide variety um, and it really comes down to what documentation you have to back it up. The government acts like a forensic accountant. They want to see tax returns. They want to see bank statements. It is a highly technical process and you need to work with an experienced immigration attorney to put it together. Yes, you can use um, gifts or loans from parents or friends as long as you can document how the person who is providing the loan or gift earn that money. Yes, you can use your home as collateral and get a home equity line of credit and use the proceeds from that for EB-5. Um, you know, yes, it can come from multiple sources. It can come from within the United States. It can come from without the United, from outside the United States. Um, there's also the possibility um, in certain circumstances where you can file your I-526 and your adjustment and get your spot in the line and get your EAD and advanced parole just by being in actively in the process of investing. Um, and so there are lots of uh, different ways that we can um, sort of strategize with the investor to make sure that it meets their immigration goal. I I guess my, my main point is you just really need to work with somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, it's not as easy as it would seem. It generally takes us a few weeks to put together these uh, legal uh, briefs on source of funds. And there's back and forth asking for certain documents, making sure that we have, you know, debits and credits matching. It's 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 a lot of work. And, and that's the big part of what an EB-5 attorney does. We put that all together before you invest so that when that investment goes in, we feel very confident about your case being approved. All right. We have a lot of uh, you know questions and comments. We, we kind of have a, a limited time period here. So we'll, we'll get through this and then try to answer as many as we can um, at the end of this. And I'll, I'll give a quick brief just on, on EB-5 United and then go ahead and get into the structure of some of these EB-5 projects. Uh, so we're, we're closing in for, for EB-5 United, we're closing in on a billion dollars raised through the EB-5 program um, over the past 14 years. And so we've helped uh, more, more than investors obtain more than 2,000 green cards for themselves and their family members and uh, have a, a pristine track record. We have a, a large team throughout the world and uh, we're kind of based all over. I have, we have Duncan is, is based in Miami. He's here here with us. Um, and, and this is kind of our, our key sales team. 
based all over. We, we also have a, a big marketing department. So we have a little over 30 people involved in our organization. And these are our past projects that we have completed uh, throughout our history. And I'll just get in right now. You know, we'd be happy to, to discuss these all further with anyone who's interested in our projects, interested in our history. Uh, we'll, we will be happy to get you in touch with one of our sales representatives and, and have a consultation. Uh, but here, I'm just going to go briefly through the structure of the of an EB-5 project. The NCE, this is essentially an EB-5 fund. So when we are structuring an EB-5 project, we will first start off by setting up an entity that is an EB-5 fund. This is technically a private equity fund. And you as an EB-5 investor are making a, an investment into this fund, you're buying one share of it worth $800,000. So when you send money to an EB-5 project, the initial money that you're sending is going to an account for a company that you own one share of, right? So you're not sending the money to EB-5 United. You're not sending the money to whatever regional center you're working with. You're sending it to a company that you own a share of. Then that money will get loaned from the EB-5 fund or the NCE to what is called the JCE, the job creating entity. That money can go in as debt or as equity into that project. And this is where the jobs must be created. As we mentioned, when you use the regional center program, you will have, you'll be able to utilize an economic model. Now there are direct jobs, indirect jobs and induced jobs. A portion of the jobs will have to be direct and then the, the rest can be induced and indirect. And so we're able to count all of those jobs when we utilize the regional center program. You're also going to have other people, maybe a bank is putting money into the project. The developer is obviously going to be putting money into the project. The more, the higher percentage of money that the developer is putting into the project usually is a sign that that is lowering your risk in the project, which we'll go through here in just a second, because unless you are a form of equity, the developer uh, is, is kind of on the hook and they're, they are, they're going to make the biggest gains in the project, but they're also going to be the first to lose some of their money in the project if things were to go south. So this is looking at the, the different types of ways to invest into really any project, not just EB-5, but any real estate development project. Here you can see senior debt, which is typically the position of a bank. Why do banks lend as a senior lender and they're not putting in common equity or, or MES debt into, into most projects? It's because banks are trying to preserve capital. And what a bank is out seeking to do is to put money into different sectors into the economy and preserve that capital and outpace, outpace inflation. And so in like a high interest rate environment right now, this is why all bank loans are usually tied to something like SOFR, where that is a, a, an index that rises and falls. That way, if the interest rates go up, the bank's going to have a higher interest rate so they can continue to outpace inflation. Banks are looking for capital preservation. You can invest as EB-5 into the senior loan position. That is what we like to do at EB-5 United, and that's how a lot of our projects are structured. And that gives us the utmost amount of security that we can find in the project, as long as we have significant equity behind us that has to be lost before. And so what that means is that if a, a project, if a developer, a JC, a job creating entity, if that defaults, on the EB-5 loan from the NCE or the EB-5 fund that you own a share of, then your NCE, your EB-5 fund has the first rights to take that project from the developer. It's like you're getting a mortgage, right? From a bank. If you don't pay your mortgage every month to the bank, the bank will repossess your house. And as long as it's worth more than what they lent it to you for, then the bank's not going to lose money, right? So that's why banks usually will only let you lend will only lend you up to 80% of the money for a house and if they want if you want to get more you need like an FHA loan which is government subsidized so that the government pays the bank back if they have to take your house and it's not worth as much as they lent to you. So then you get into mez to a mezzanine loan which is a second position loan. So the bank the the senior lender will always be repaid first and have first rights to foreclose. Mez would get paid second. Then you get into preferred equity and developer equity. These usually preferred and common equity, as you would say, for developer equity, 
that is that is you know your eight hundred thousand dollar amount and your return is going to be dependent on the sex success of the project and you're also if if the project loses money at all you can lose money with the developer usually if you're a mes loan or a senior loan the developer would have to be wiped out before you would be impacted financially as an investor so these are the different ways it, it's difficult to sell common equity in EB-5 because usually you're still seeing maybe a two, three, four percent interest rate on, on equity investments that usually are paying 20 to 30 percent rates of return for the amount of risk you're taking. And it's difficult for us to sell that. So that's why we really focus on capital preservation, first position lending. And I, it's why we, we feel that we are, are trying to what, what we see is, is that our job in this project, in all our EB-5 projects, is to meet the at-risk conditions of the program because the money has to be technically at risk, but it's our job to lower that risk as much as possible. Just because it's an at-risk program does not mean that your investment has to be risky or, or, or inordinately risky. And so that's this is kind of a, just the base of the, the different ways that you can set up projects. You can see some of our past projects. We're not gonna get into financials and details of our current deals. If you wanna know about those, please contact Duncan or other or, or, or myself and we'll get you in touch with, with people on our team that can help out. Um, but these are for past projects for securities reasons. We're not gonna talk about the current ones, but here you can see we were at $88 million senior lender on a, a hotel project in New York City. Um, we were a $173.6 million senior lender on the one and only project that we did last year. Um, that project had $126 million of equity and the other deal had $135 million in, in equity. So essentially, if, if the developer was not to repay those loans or was to default on those loans, then we would have the EB-5 fund, the NCE, would have the first rights to take those projects. And as long as they are worth 39.5% or 57.9%, of what they were built for, we would recover all the funds for the EB-5 investors. And I'm gonna turn it over to Duncan here to kind of go through and just give you a, a quick brief on some of our, our current projects. Um, you know, the one, the one and only project is the last project we did in, in Big Sky. It has now reached 100 I-526E petitions approved. So that's an, an average of six months per approval. We've had the shortest was 29 days. We had a couple in 30 days, 31 days, 36 days, a couple dozen in less than 60 days. So the priority processing has really been working. We already have about six investors in that project that have obtained a green card um, through their 485 change of status. And so that's the majority of the people who are, are on this webinar uh, will be obtaining their green card that way. Bernie, you wanna take a couple, maybe five, 10 minutes to answer a few questions here or? I've knocked out quite a few of the big ones. Uh, I see we've actually answered 42 questions so yep, far. I've been going at it too. <laughs> and, um, but realistically, what I would encourage people to do is, you know, follow up. If it's a EB-5, if it's an investor related question uh, and you're, you know, looking for projects or are an existing investor, obviously reach out to the EB-5 United team and if it's an immigration related question uh, and you do not have counsel or maybe even if you want a second opinion, feel free to reach out to uh, Joey or myself. We're pretty easy to find, you know, you can just search the name, it'll come up quite quickly. But um, I think we've pretty much covered everything. I, I just want to keep emphasizing again and again, look, you know, from some of the questions, if you're not born in India or China, you you don't really need to be too anxious about waiting lines. Um, we don't expect to see waiting lines develop in those other areas. But if you are born in India or China, I really just think you need to move in the next few months. Um, I hope Charlie's right that the door is still going to be open in 2025. But remember what Charlie said. The earlier you get your place in line, when you file your 526, that's your priority date. That's what you're seeing in the visa bulletin. 
And I can think of nothing more important than getting what I'm going to call a low priority date by filing your 526 as soon as possible, whether you're filing concurrent for adjustment or you're waiting to consular process in your home country. The critical point is to get a low priority date under this relatively new program because for Indian nationals, even if you're EB1, even if you qualify for the genius visa, you've got years and years to wait. There's literally no door for Indians right now other than marriage to U.S. citizen or EB5. It's shocking. Personally, I think it's disgusting, but it's a reality. And for Chinese nationals, the waiting lines are also terrible. So, folks, right. if you're able to invest, I think this is the program to look at. Bernie, I just want to I just want to say one other thing here. It, for anyone out there looking for information, basic information, you know, I'd reach out to us. But also, if you go to eb5united.com and check out our website, the What Is EB5 page, we break down the process step by step. Every single step is explained. You can see all this information we went through today. There's videos of myself explaining the program. Uh, I have a couple new videos up there, uh, but I, I'm about to film a couple other new ones as well. And so we'll, we'll, we'll always have more updated information on the program there. I do want to just cover one quick question. Maybe, Joey, if you'd like to answer this one. We do have a few investors that are from pre-RIA who are asking about adjudication. I know that those positions have not been been approved as quickly as, as the post-RIA with the new laws. Um, could you maybe give a little insight? I mean, we are still seeing post the people pre-RIA being approved. It is taking some more time, which is unfortunate, and we don't think that that's, that's right for USCIS uh, to necessarily be doing that. But also, if there are some of those investors who have not taken advantage of getting a, a, a an advanced parole travel permit and an EAD, uh, I think a lot of the people on this webinar are in the United States. If you could maybe say that, tell, let them know that they can do that as well. Sure. Um, so there, I think there were over 4,200 I-526s that were filed in November of 2019. It's a lot of cases. And that is what USCIS is working through. Um, we are getting approvals for cases that were filed in November of 2019. There's just a lot of them. So I hate to say be more patient because it's already been five or four and a half years, but it's um, there's really little we can do other than potentially filing a lawsuit against the government, which they are, are fighting on. Sure. For those in the United States, this adjustment of status provision, which came into place in 2022, applies towards you. So even if you're a pre-RIA investor, you can still do adjustment of status. We have with gotten- With a pending case. I think that's so important. Case. Yes, People with a pending don't case. understand that if you have a, if you're in the US on an F1 or an H1 and you have a pending case and you haven't filed an adjustment, now's the time to do it to Correct. get these derivative benefits. It's, it's huge and it's wonderful. But Joey, just to be a little optimistic, because yeah, you know, during COVID it was very frustrating during the lapse of the program. You know, it's been very uncomfortable because basically it ended up taking, you know, a year or two longer than expected. But let's be a little bit positive. We are getting quite a lot of adjudications come through now, right? I mean, oh, yeah. the no, last they've... few months has been finally we're starting to see the sunshine again and we're getting approval. So it's it's been very frustrating with COVID and, and with the program lapse. But the train's definitely moving again and seems to be moving a little faster is that is that accurate from your 100 yeah 100 percent. we've had way more adjudications in 2024 already than i think there was in 2022 and 2023 combined i mean they right. really are going uh at least for eb5 gangbusters over there on on their processing and, and we hope it just they, continues to grow they promised that they're going to improve we were skeptical but we are seeing improvement so i'm going to remain a little bit optimistic and now with these new um uh, government filing fees they promise they're going to hire some more train some more adjudicators so i'm going to be a little bit optimistic not too optimistic but you know these new government filing fees are pretty high and they should have some revenue to hire and train more staff so hopefully we'll see some improvement but right now what we're seeing on the rural cases is 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 quite phenomenal just so fast
uh, that uh, it it shocked me at least. Uh, I mean, we had a green card a green card applied for or an I five two six E petition filed October 9th, approved November 9th, Green card issued, adjustment of status February 9th. Four, Four months. months. That's Crazy. just it's unreal. It's something that we never even even back in 2012 13 when I was getting into the industry. And I know Bernie, you you've seen it since the, the inception. It's I mean, we've never seen anything like this. You know, we've never seen anything, but I'm going to still call that an aberration. I hope that becomes the reality. But that's proof of, you know, the fact that they seem to like your project. They're not having a problem with your project. You've got project approval on some of them. And that, you know, certainly makes a difference. And, um, I, you know, I'm not going to promise anybody for five months, but no, uh, no, not at all. It, it, it's uh there is a random aspect which people need to know about. It just, they don't seem to follow uh, FIFO, first in, first out. Um, I, I wish I knew the system. But one thing I will tell people is if you look at the processing times on the USCIS website, they are incredibly pessimistic and negative. They don't seem to display uh these wonderful results that we're getting uh particularly on the rural premium uh priority processing cases that's not displayed on the uscis website but we've got the approvals in the hand we can show how fast we're getting them i still like to say to people look don't expect a decision within less than six to eight months on a rural uh project but uh it varies well, I think largely all positive things in, in the industry right now, you know, we've got some some maybe looming retrogression here in the, in the coming year or so. But as of now, we're seeing quick adjudications. We're seeing successful projects. And, you know, I think it was a very productive seminar to cover all of that. And so I want to thank you all for your time. Charles, Bernie, Joey, thank you very much for coming on today. And for all investors, these are our personal lines, our emails. So this is a great way to get in contact with us, whether you have immigration questions, you know, have questions that you want to send Brennan or I via WhatsApp. We're always available, so feel free to reach out and man, look forward to speaking with you all. So again, thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank thanks you, Brennan everyone. and Brennan. Thank right, you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.